Thank you, Doug. Welcome to another in a series of program meetings sponsored by the Woods and Wetlands Group of the Illinois Sierra Club. My name is Rosemary Heileman. Our program meetings feature speakers on topics relating to our environment, stewardship, wildlife and nature, public policy, and anything about outdoor activities like hiking and canoeing and bird watching. In a minute, we will hear from our featured speaker, Mike Priscilla. But first, a couple of remarks. As Doug said, we are recording. <coughs> Pardon me. As Doug said, we are recording this so that you can watch it in the future. Turn off your camera if you don't wish to appear on the video. We will send out the YouTube address for the program later this week so you can watch it again. Before we get begin, make sure you are muted, especially if you have a barking dog, a television, or other commotion in the background. And to ask any questions of the speaker, we encourage you to use the chat box at the bottom of your screen. We will select questions afterward and they will be directed to the speaker. So let's move on to our March featured speaker. Mike Priscilla is the planning supervisor for the Lake County Stormwater Management Commission, where he has been on staff for more than 16 years. The commission is a countywide agency charged with coordinating the stormwater activities of more than 80 local jurisdictions to improve water quality, reduce flood damages, and restore and enhance the natural drainage system. Mike has a bachelor's degree in geography from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and a master's degree in environmental and urban geography from the U University of Illinois at Chicago. And he li has lived less than a mile from the Des Plaines River in Lake County for most of his life. We welcome you, Mike. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Rosemary. Um, appreciate the, the opportunity to uh, talk to you folks tonight. And um, I imagine, uh, uh, you know, a lot of you have probably much more uh, experience uh, recently or over your lifetimes with the Des Plaines River than I do. Um, but it is uh, something that, um, you know, is a bit of a, a personal interest of mine, as well as uh, something that I tend to deal with professionally on a, if not a day-to-day -day basis, a nearly daily basis. So um, this is a good opportunity for me to uh, you know, I, I work with a lot of civil engineers. I'm a geographer by training, so uh, I'll be able to show you some maps tonight and uh, maybe a little bit of the engineering and stuff like that will creep in here. But, uh, you know, hopefully we can keep it uh, a little more general interest than that. Um, but, uh, yeah, thank you, Rosemary, and thank you all for uh, for having me tonight. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and... Uh, turn my video off so that I'm not distracting everyone with my little floating head here and then I'll I'll jump back on when we're done. Okay. So uh yeah, thank uh, again uh you know the introduction that the Rosemary gave kind of summed up who I work for. Um the Stormwater Management Commission has been around now for over 30 years and um we are charged with coordinating stormwater uh, management activities across the county. Um, and uh, we kind of do that in a couple of ways. Uh, and the two major ways we do that are one through um, a regulatory authority that we have. We administer a countywide, uh, a countywide stormwater and watershed development ordinance. And then we also, uh, develop plans and implement projects in order to uh, accomplish this mission that's here on the, the screen in front of you to improve water quality, reduce flood damage and restore and enhance the, the, the natural drainage system, AKA the streams, rivers, lakes and wetlands uh, throughout the county. So uh, I don't wanna get into a whole lot of, uh, of you know government speak here so i think i'll i'll stop it there but um that's kind of a, a general overview of who we are and what we do and you know we can get into that a little more during the discussion if, if folks are interested but we were formed basically as a response to flooding that occurred uh 
not only in Lake County, but throughout Northeastern Illinois in 1986, um, and several of the other co collar counties uh, in Northeastern Illinois uh, also formed stormwater agencies uh, as a result of, of legislation in response to those 1986 floods. Uh, and here you can see in this, uh, this newspaper article that was uh, published um, as a, during one of our anniversaries, you can see a, a photo of uh, downtown Gurney uh, during that 1986 flood on the Des Plaines River. And several of those buildings are, are no longer there, I might add. So we'll start here at the foundation. What are we actually talking about? Where are we talking? You know, what, what place are we talking about? So uh, the Des Plaines River itself, uh, you know, is fed by a watershed of, of nearly 1,500 square miles. Most of those are in Illinois. There's uh, maybe about 150 in Racine and Kenosha counties in Wisconsin. Uh, I'll be talking mostly today about this area uh, that's outlined in red here and the section of river that runs through that area in red, which is primarily in Lake County. We developed a a watershed plan for that area a few years ago. And so many of the maps will have this, uh, this area that's bounded in red here shown on it uh, because I lifted them conveniently from our, our watershed plan. Um, the Des Plaines River watershed uh, south of Lake County has been enlarged over the last couple centuries, primarily by drainage uh, into the watershed from the reversal of the Chicago River as a component of the construction of the Sanitary and Ship Canal. Um, so it actually was a bit smaller than 1,455 square miles in the, in the late 19th century. Um, of course, at, uh, at, its, at its mouth there in the southern end of the watershed, the, the Des Plaines uh, joins the Kankakee River to form the Illinois, uh, which of course is a tributary, a large tributary of the Mississippi. Uh, and if you look at this map of the continental United States here, um, you can see there um, at the southern end of the Mississippi, there's this amorphous blob that's labeled Gulf hypoxia dead zone. And so uh, there's a there's an area in the Gulf of Mexico where uh, dissolved oxygen is low or uh, non-existent. It's insufficient to support many forms of, of life. And uh, that's a direct result of, of, um, of chemicals and nutrients primarily that are coming out of the Mississippi River uh, from that large blue shaded watershed that, that you can see on that map. And that comes back to the way that we are actually managing the Des Plaines River here in Lake County in Northern Illinois. So I'll talk about that a little bit later too. So let's start kind of at the very beginning of things, or at least the beginning of things as the way they look today. Um, and that's with the uh, the last continental ice sheet that was resting upon uh, upon Northern Illinois uh, about 15 to 20,000 years ago. And on the left here, you can see kind of a generalized image of where that sheet was in relation to the current state boundaries in the upper Midwest and the generalized directions of ice advance during the, what's called the Wisconsin glaciation. So the, the most recent um, maximum extent of that continental ice sheet. Um, and, you know, it's a, it's a bit of a, you know, a mind exercise sometimes to try to imagine what it looked like to have, you know, several hundred feet to maybe a half mile of ice sitting on top of the, the current landscape, um, you know, and, and to think about that much ice you know, moving these moving across these vast distances, but of course that's what what has happened. And actually, if you wanted to, you know, go look at the remnants, the last remnants of this continental ice sheet that covered uh, northeastern Illinois, uh, you could, you know, take a trip up to Baffin Island in uh, northern Canada, and there are still a couple ice caps up there that uh, were once part of this massive 
what's called the Laurentide ice sheet that covered most of uh, northeastern North America all those years ago. And that ice sheet was divided into lobes. And those lobes are, are kind of the, the, the fingers that were moving forward and receding and expanding and contracting over, over time and formed uh, the, the surface topography that we largely see in our region today. And you can see in this map on the right that we have um, in that you know, area between uh, the state line and Chicago, you have a couple uh, morainic systems or, or um, networks of moraines, these low rolling sinuous ridges that were laid down at the margins of the glaciers. We have one that's called the Valparaiso system and one that's uh, kind of within that Valparaiso system is called the Lake Border System. And I'll show a, a more detailed map of that um, here on this next slide. But that's the generalized, uh, the generalized view of how that lobe of ice that was extending down what is today the depression that Lake Michigan lays in, that ice was moving southward as it expanded. Um, and pushing out into Illinois and Indiana and Michigan and portions of Wisconsin as well. So here's that, here, here's that map of all the uh, Wisconsin glacial, the Wisconsin era glacial moraines in, in Illinois. And on the left here, you can see that entire system uh, with the kind of the green uh, shading in it. And so those, those named moraines that are on the on the very exterior, kind of the western and southernmost extent, those would be the oldest in age. And then, as the glacier retreated, melting back to the north, um, it would then occasionally readvance and lay down another moraine within that uh, within that furthest extent. And so that's why you have these kind of concentric rings of moraines that. Uh, almost, they're almost concentric around the southern end of Lake Michigan. Um, and you can see on that map on the right with the brown shading, uh, those two systems that are, of in it, that are of interest to us locally, the Valparaiso system, which takes up a big chunk of, uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but a big chunk of the, the western half of Lake County. And then we have this lake border system, which is five individual moraines or ridges that run uh, parallel generally to the modern shoreline of Lake Michigan. And so these ridge lines kind of form the backbone of our watershed drainage systems today. Uh, one other kind of just, you know, it's Sunday night. I'm, I don't have to start work here for another several hours. Um, so I'm gonna indulge myself here with, with something that I, I just find fascinating. So as those, as those glaciers were retreating, um, and actually, let me go back a slide. You can see right here, there's this very definitive, um, very definitive interruption in the Valparaiso moraine system. Um, and that interruption was caused by overflow from an ancestral, uh, an ancestor to Lake Michigan, a, a glacial lake that that geologists call Lake Chicago, and it it breached the Valparaiso moraine and flowed down the modern Des Plaines River Valley um, into into the Illinois and the and the ancestral Mississippi rivers. So at one point, Lake Michigan, or what would become Lake Michigan. Was was actually draining, much the way it does today, actually through the <laughs> through the uh, Chicago Sanitary and Ship Canal. It was draining through that Valparaiso moraine out into the um, out into the Mississippi River, rather than uh, you know what we would think of as its its modern drainage out through the St. Lawrence into the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and similarly, this ancestor to Lake Erie for some time drained into the Wabash drainage. And there was an ancestor, an ancestral glacial lake near Duluth, Minnesota that drained 
through the St. Croix River in what's now northern Wisconsin uh, down into the Mississippi as well. So you had, um, you know, a few of these ancestors to the Great Lakes that were actually draining through the Mississippi River watershed rather than through the St. Lawrence, which of course, as you can see in the map on the right, was was blocked by ice. Um, so again, one of those things that's just hard to, it's hard to even imagine, um, you know, Lake Michigan being tens of feet higher than it is today and draining out through um, this, you know, what would have been a, probably a massively impressive, uh, you know, outlet here um, in, uh, in Northeastern Illinois. So anyways, back to, back to Lake County and, uh, and uh, the moraine systems that we have here. So I'm, I'm showing again on the, on the map on the left here, this, uh, this system of lake border and the Valparaiso moraines. And you can see here how they really do influence the, the modern drainage system. So the Des Plaines River is this darker black uh, black line, and you can see that that just uh, really cuts a path right right through these the gaps in these moraines. You can see some of the other tributaries. This is the North Mill and Mill Creek uh, water, uh, drainage system here, North Mill and, and Mill Creek here uh, running right, basically right along the, the depression in between the, the Tinley and Valparaiso moraines, and then it kind of makes a makes a cut right across uh, to drain into into the Des Plaines River. And you can see so, several of these other tributaries that that you know their paths are basically um, forced by this topography that was laid down by the last ice sheet. And on the right here you can kind of see how uh, you know in again in a kind of schematic type of way, but you can kind of see what that landscape would have looked like as that ice sheet was retreating from what's now the Des Plaines River Valley. And you can, you know, you can kind of imagine um, this terminal moraine here on the left, uh, you know, let's say that's like the Tinley moraine. And you can imagine all this meltwater and sediment coming off this glacier. And, you know, the Des Plaines River sort of picking up and you know, running down through uh, between these moraines and then, you know, cutting over, uh, cutting over one of them and then continuing southward. And that's essentially what happened as these, as this ice sheet was, was retreating and readvancing. It continually was depositing um, through both uh, the ice that was breaking off of it, the calving that was occurring, as well as the the rivers of meltwater that were coming off the surface and running underneath this, this massive glacier. Um, it was depositing feet and feet and feet of sediment um, in what is now the Des Plaines River Valley. And that is the reason that as you drive along the river, um, whether it be on, you know, Milwaukee Avenue or, or um, you know, Route 45 or 21, depending on where you are in, in Lake County or, or up uh, US 41, you'll see the remains of numerous sand and gravel operations, gravel pits. And that's because there are feet of glacial gravel and sand deposits that were laid down as that, as that uh, ice sheet was retreating. The modern Des Plaines River and its floodplain has um, a bit different sediment characteristic, and uh, and we can talk about that here um, in the coming slides as well. But before I get into that, I do want to mention some of the early human presence uh, along the river and in the watershed. Um, one thing that I just think is amazing is uh, there, the presence of um, woolly mammoth uh, remains that have been found in 
the Wisconsin and uh, Illinois portions of the Des Plaines watershed. And those are remarkable in themselves, but um, in particular, ones like this find in uh, near Bristol in Southern Kenosha County, um, right along Route 45 at what's called, the, it's called the Mud Lake Mammoth. It was discovered in 1936. And the bones of that mammoth have evidence of butchering on them. Those bones were dated to, uh, to more than 13,500 years before present. Um, so for almost a century, uh, this was the oldest mammoth butchering site that had been found in North America. And it was, you know, right, right there in, in Bristol. Um, and of course, Bristol is, you know, now known for a different historical celebration, their Renaissance Fair. But, um, you know, this, this uh, Mud Lake Mammoth is just, a, I mean, that's an incredible find. Um, just last year, there was a, a, a mammoth that was unearthed or discovered in uh, in New Mexico that had butchering marks on it that pushed the the date way back it more than doubled uh, that 13,500 mark but um, this is not the only the only mammoth that's been found in this area there was one uh, discovered in Wadsworth in the 1990s along with uh, the remnants of a spruce forest and of course, spruce forests are now kind of synonymous with boreal forests, like you might find on the Canadian Shield north of Lake Superior in, you know, northern Ontario or Quebec or northern Manitoba. So, um, you know, it's one thing to try to wrap your head around, you know, seeing bison moving across a restored oak savanna in Northern Illinois. It's another thing entirely to try to wrap your head around seeing, you know, mammoths striding across a forest of black spruce in Northern Illinois. But um, that of course is the way that um, the succession of these vegetation and, and uh, wildlife communities works. Um, but that's part of the you know, part of the natural history of this watershed and this and this river as well. So as I mentioned, of course, the, the climate did change. And at the time of European American settlement, uh, the, the vegetation was quite different. And um, the, the, the river today largely is a, is a result of the, the climatic changes that have occurred since that um, last glacial period, uh, we know what the pre-settlement vegetation was approximately like because we have surveyor's notes from the original general land office federal township surveys. They walked every section line and they recorded what kind of vegetation was there. And so folks have reconstructed uh, maps of, of what those communities would have been like. And you can see much of the much of the Des Plaines River watershed was either prairie, this um, this yellowish color here, or savanna, the the lighter pink. The darker pink, which you'll notice is primarily east of the Des Plaines River, are uh, the more wooded, timbered, uh, you know, more dense woodlands. Um, and as I understand it, again, I'm not a landscape ecologist. Uh, but as I understand it, you know, that was primarily due to the fact that the river act as a fire break as those fires, whether they be natural or lit by, um, you know, the original inhabitants of uh, original human inhabitants of this area. Um, as those fires moved with the prevailing winds from west to east, the river would kind of act as a fire break. And so there tended to be more dense forests on the on the eastern side of the of the river. And that you know, to some extent is still the case today. Um, and these are just some of the examples of what, what some of those, um, some of those former or pre-settlement uh, landscapes might've looked like. They're not 
obviously former landscapes. These are um, modern images of those, of course. So prairies and oak savanna, woodland, uh, and, and marsh as well here. So one of the dominant forms of wetland that we have, have in our, our region here. Also much reduced, I, sh I should add. So the river itself, um, you know, sometimes, uh, particularly in my line of work, you, you wind up working on a project and, you know, there's some conjecture about what maybe a restored waterway should look like. And, um, you know, you, you really have to be careful when you're engaging in that sort of a conversation that you're being realistic given what your, you know, what your landscape is. So uh, the geomorphologists out there, the folks that study the way that, uh, you know, that the earth's surface looks, whether it's, you know, mountains or rivers or, or deserts, what have you, um, you know, when they're talking about rivers, they'll generally talk about three different types of uh, characteristic river channel types. So there are braided, braided streams, there are straight channel streams and there are meandering channel streams. And our Desplaines River here is a classic meandering channel. Um, you know, braided channel streams, I, I tend to think of, um, you know, these things that you see when you're in the mountains out west where uh, they're just full of very large types of sediment. So stuff that's bigger than sand or gravel, you know, cobbles and boulders. And you might see, you know, they don't just have the one, the one uh, thalweg or the one main channel, but you might, you know, they're literally braided around these huge rock bars everywhere. Um, and that's just not something that we see typically here in our, um, in our corner of the Midwest. Um, we have these meandering single single thalweg channels and you can see the old meander cutoffs. Uh, this I think is a section of, uh, of the river north of Wadsworth Road. And you can just see where over time it's just been moving back and forth, back and forth across its floodplain. Um, and that's the type of, uh, you know, that's the type of, of stream that we have. And it's looked that way as long as we've been taking pictures of it. It hasn't changed that characteristic a whole lot. And there's a lot of places where, you know, I'd, I'd say that these days we have a little bit better buffers. There's more vegetation on most of the banks of the river. But you can see here in this picture, you've got a high bank on the right side. You've got this lower, more gently sloping bank on the left. And sure enough, it's coming around a bend here. The outside bank is where the high bank is. The inside bank is where the low bank is. The river's not going to change its behavior, right? It's a, it's at its core. It's just a collection of physical, biological, and chemical processes that have been going on, you know, for eons. So let's take a pause here, and we'll maybe go to something that's a little more human about the about the river, uh, the name of it, and I have as I guess maybe a curiosity done a little bit of delving into where the Des Plaines River actually got its name. I remember as a kid, uh, people just telling me that it just meant of the plains, um, which I don't think that is true. Um, maybe my, uh, my Wisconsin <laughs> education makes me a, you know, a little more sympathetic to uh, increase Lapham's um, account uh, from one of one of his manuscripts that the displays um, is that the name is derived from a species of maple uh, that the French called the plain because it resembled the leaves uh, resembled European plane tree leaves and they do they look very maple-ish. Um, the Aboriginal name and I've seen a couple different uh, renderings of that that are that are fairly similar um, that also were said to translate to the maple tree river or soft maple river um, and certainly we can attest that uh, O plane whether it's spelled with the letter O or with the French rendering AU or AUX um, that that certainly was common and it still sticks around uh, in our county today 
Um, one of our one of our county highways still bears that name. Uh, Gurney was once called O Plain Bridge, and these two images here are taken from the same atlas of Lake County in 1885. One, uh, the Libertyville Township page, uh, spells the name of the river Des Plaines, and the Warren Township page spells it O Plain. So there wasn't even agreement among uh, the the people putting together the 1885 atlas of of what it should be called. So. That's about as far as I'm going to stick my neck out on what the true story of the the name is. I've heard other, you know, other versions of this. You can look it up on the you know, Libertyville Mundelein Historical Society has has a version that doesn't quite jive with with what I have here. But um, uh, I'll leave that up to you. This is the one I'm going with. Um, but yeah, so as you know, the landscape began to be settled by European Americans, uh, certainly things changed. Agriculture was introduced. Um, and that, of course, had a had an impact on the river and the and the water. Um, we also, of course, have changed the uh, the hydrologic characteristics of the landscape. So we changed the way that water runs through the watershed and to the river. Um, when we were developing a watershed plan for, for the displays, we looked at impervious cover. So what areas, um, what areas of the watershed uh, basically generate um, more runoff than they would under sort of natural vegetative uh, circumstances. So you, you know, you, you take something that's forest or grassland and you um, put hard surfaces on it, whether those are homes with roofs or, uh, you know, it's compacted earth for some other activity, roadways, all those things, um, they're going to change the runoff characteristics of the watershed. And that imperviousness has been linked in research to uh, degradation of water quality. And so we tend to look at these areas that have 30 to 100 percent impervious cover as being at risk of contributing uh, more significantly to water quality degradation. The other thing we did to the Desplaines River is we uh, actually added flow to it. So um, I live in Libertyville. I live on the west side of the Desplaines River. When I turn on my uh, water, uh, that's water that's coming from Lake Michigan. When it goes down the drain, uh, it goes into uh, it goes into my sanitary sewer system in town that goes to a treatment plant that treats it and then discharges it to the Desplaines River. And so it doesn't go back to Lake Michigan. Um, so the Desplaines River is getting some additional flow from uh, wastewater effluent. So much so, in fact, that the uh, USGS, the United States Geological Survey, has changed the way that they they had to change how they um, manage their data at um, at the Gurney gauge on uh, on the displays at 120. So you can see here, and I promise I don't have too many of these graphs, but um, this is basically showing that the dotted line. This is prior to 1975, all their data. Um, it shows that basically the very low flows, so flows that are exceeded 90 or 100% of the time, those low flows were like one cubic feet per second. So like barely, it basically, you know, this the Desplaines River could get down to basically dry prior to 1975. Um, after 1975, flow might get very low but it doesn't get down to zero or one it's still there's still water in it all the time um and so uh i think when i think i calculated it out i mean i think that low flow went, going from one to whatever it was it increased like 3900 times or something like 3900 fold increase in the the absolute low base flow of the river 
Um, so we've changed the hydrology of the river to some extent. And the, the, it looks like a small gap, but it's a significant gap in between these lines that shows that. One of the results, um, not just of the changed hydrology, but of where we have built our communities um, is that, you know, we're kind of in nature's path now. And so the display, you know, they call the, the yellow or the, uh, the Wang Ho River in China, you know, it's known as China's sorrow. Well, um, I think growing up, you know, we probably could have called the displays, you know, Gurney's sorrow. Um, it seemed like, uh, it seemed like that, you know, there was a, it seemed like there was a threat of a flood or a flood occurring, you know, every year. Um, but there have been several significant events on the displays uh, in Lake County. Um, this 1960 flood is of interest because it kind of spurred the first floodplain mapping in our region. Of course, 1986 is kind of the one that everyone, uh, at least in my world, tends to remember. Um, sort of got everybody thinking about flooding and trying to manage that. And then these subsequent floods in the in the next few decades um, that approached or even like in 2017 actually broke the record of the 1986 flood um, in terms of the the height of the flooding and what you can see in this map here on the on the left um, there are a lot of houses and structures that have been built in floodplains and so you know that's one of the things that um, you know we try to manage it in our agency we try to manage that uh, you know, through a voluntary uh, buyout program. I know there are other communities in the county that are that are doing a similar thing, but you know, some of this, you know, some of this uh, flood impact that we have is because of where we've built, and some of it is because of the changing nature of the hydrology in the watershed. Also, we've had an impact on water quality. That's undeniable. I know it's St. Patrick's Day weekend, but this river should not probably be that green. Um, plus it's not the Chicago River. So, you know, things like this that are evidence of, you know, probably excess nutrient inputs are something that we need to manage. And this is, uh, you know, a contributor to that hypoxia that's going on in the in the Gulf of Mexico right now. The map on the left, that shows the impaired waters that have been assessed by Illinois EPA. And basically that map is saying that um, none of those stretches of the Des Plaines River, at least in 2016, but I can tell you they're the same 2022, they have the same assessment, um, that they're not supporting the uh, aquatic life general use. So there should be a, a more diverse assortment of fish and, and aquatic insects uh, in these river segments. The displays is also impaired for fish consumption based on mercury and PCBs. We can get into that in the discussion. I'm not gonna touch so much on that here, um, but that's another impairment. So those are some things that maybe aren't going 100% great in the in the watershed over time, but there are good things happening. And there are a lot of good people working hard to, um, to make positive changes. So one of those, you know, our agency, the Stormwater Management Commission, I mentioned we, we've been administering a, a regulatory ordinance for 30 years now that um, has drastically uh, change the effects that flooding has on at least new development. Um, in 2017, when we had that flood event, I think we calculated that something like 95 or 92 percent of all the reports of flooding came from uh, structures that were constructed prior to the advent of this watershed development ordinance. So homes that have been constructed in the last 30 years are generally um, high and dry, safe from flooding. The other thing I mentioned that we do is we 
develop and implement watershed plans. And um, we work, and when I say implement, we work with partners to build, build projects that will do things like reduce the amount of erosion coming off of the watershed into the Des Plaines River. This picture here at the bottom, that's Van Patten Woods. Um, that's an old agricultural field that had this, you know, huge gully running into it, just, um, just pouring sediment into the river that, you know, we're, we're trying to work with the forest preserve to arrest that sort of thing. The forest preserve, you know, can't say enough good stuff about what they're doing. Uh, just their, you know, their ownership of land along the river is, um, is a great best management practice in itself in terms of floodplain management. They've been removing dams. These are the, there's three dam locations here in the county um, that I've highlighted on that map. So they've been taking dams out to improve, uh, improve uh, fish and, and other uh, biological movement throughout the, throughout the river. Forest Preserve also uh, partnered on the wetlands demonstration project up in Wadsworth um, that, you know, was initially constructed in 1985. Um, it's been kind of a living laboratory ever since. And, uh, you know, there's, I'd encourage you to go check out their, their website. They've got lots of research published there about um, the beneficial functions of wetlands, about the, um, you know, the ability to restore wetlands in the landscape. And, uh, you know, in terms of, in terms of this particular site right here adjacent to the Des Plaines River, uh, the ability of wetlands to clean the water. So taking out, uh, basically filtering out sediment and pollutants um, as it flows in from the north and, and uh, settling those out and clarifying the water as it comes out on the south end. There's also been the development of a watershed work group uh, for the Des Plaines River. Again, in response to uh, really the federal effort to reduce the amount of nutrients that are leaching into the Mississippi River and, and Gulf of Mexico. So in 2014, over 30 units of government came together to create this work group to initially begin a comprehensive monitoring program um, but now also developing uh, a nutrient assessment and reduction plan for the for the sewage treatment plants that are that are part of the that are part of the work group, um, and they're also talking about the potential to uh, develop projects that'll improve aquatic habitat and and reduce the amount of uh, non-point source pollution that's entering um, that's entering the river from the watershed. So that's a huge compendium of all these local units of government, as well as some non-permit holding uh, organizations such as the Sierra Club and, and my organization, the Stormwater Management Commission. So one of the things that that monitoring uh, has yielded is a vast, um, a vast array of data. You can go on the Displains Workgroup's website and look at it, um, but you know, I like looking at pictures of fish. Um, so I thought I would throw this in here. These are some of the more kind of common species here at the top. Um, it's definitely a kind of a sunfish family oriented uh, watershed with the, the various, uh, you know, the bluegill, the green sunfish, largemouth bass, they're all kind of in that same group of species as well as several others that are common in the, or occurring in the, in the watershed. And then some of these more kind of rare rare to the watershed species that we've been uh, encountering more frequently in recent years. So that's a that's a positive note. Um, and then I guess I just as I close here, I know we're getting short on time. I want to just uh, you know, if I was a prognosticator, I wouldn't be here uh, doing this and my bracket uh, <laughs> for March Madness wouldn't look the way it does. Um, but so I, I think based on current trends, I can maybe comment a little bit about what the future holds. So we know there's going to be some stressors on this watershed in the you know not too distant future. We know that climate is changing. Um, the Illinois State Water Survey has published data that shows that 
you know, the frequency of intense rainfall events has, has increased dramatically over the last 30 years. We know that there will be species invasions. Um, those continue to occur. In fact, uh, the work group and it's one of its more recent rounds of monitoring did encounter round gobies in the Des Plaines River in this area. Um, and we know there will be other continued stressors related to just, um, you know, basically urban development and things like that. So um, we would expect the watershed to become more built out over the, you know, coming decades. Um, so we know there's going to be continued stressors on the river environment, but there's some good things that are happening. So the Illinois DNR just summarized, they, they put out a report a few years ago, uh, their fisheries biologists put out a report uh, summarizing the trend over the last like 40 years of fish sampling in the Des Plaines River. And they found that species richness has increased dramatically. Um, and so that's, I mean, that's a really, really positive sign. I mean, fish are basically the, the driver or 50% of the driver of, um, you know, how these water quality impairments are determined. So, um, you know, you see a lot of things happening during those, during those years. So that 75, that's right after the Clean Water Act um, was passed. Uh, you know, look at 1990, that's when stormwater management agencies were being, were being established in all these counties that you see on this map. Um, you know, there's a bunch of grant programs coming online, dam removals start happening, all these things contributing to the improvement in really what we're concerned about, I think. And that's the, you know, the ability of this river to support a baseline level of biodiversity in it. And then the monitoring that the work group is doing, this is a really complicated graph, but what I'll show you here, this is this is median total phosphorus, one of the nutrients that we're really concerned about. Uh, and you can see here, 2016, these, these black circles, the total phosphorus is fairly high. It's been creeping down ever since. And so that's, that's probably largely because of, um, of upgrades at wastewater treatment plants. But again, these are positive steps that we're taking um, and that are, being borne out in actual data um, that we can point to and say, yeah, these are improvements that are being made in this watershed, in this waterway um, as we move here into the future. And so I think that's, uh, you know, a really positive uh, note and hopefully, um, you know, kind of a, a, uh, a beacon or whatever you want to call it, you know, a, a positive arrow in the, in the direction that we're we're moving here in the future in the in the Des Plaines watershed and on the Des Plaines River. So with that, I'm a little over time. I want to thank everybody for uh, for your time today, and um, yeah, happy to answer some questions. Um, and I'll uh, I'll leave this screen up here. And um, I don't know, Rosemary or uh, mm -hmm. Doug, can I just start going through the well, we'll have uh, Steve and Linda will pick out the okay. questions. And okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Can you hear me, Mike? This is Steve. Yeah, I can hear you, Steve. Okay. The first one on here is from Elaine. And the question is, is duckweed or algae bloom? Uh, she's, oh, it was that, that picture. Photo? That yeah. photo. Oh, okay. I, that was that picture. All right. Good. I, that's a good question. I'm guessing it was a little bit of both. <laughs> okay. All right. But, yeah, I, I can tell you exactly which one it is. All right. Wanda had a question or a comment about how the river was dirtier in the 60s when she was here, but then you answered it a little bit further on in the um, uh, in the presentation. So I guess I don't need to ask you about that. Um, I have another one here. Someone, June says, are there any Asian carp in the river? That's a good question. I believe there have been some found down in the uh, like Joliet Shanahan region. Um, I've talked to Steve Pesciatelli, who's the IDNR uh, streams biologist uh, for Northern Illinois, about that very issue. And my understanding from him is that the the river, at least this far north in Illinois, is not really prime habitat for the for that 
both of those species, the silver and big head, that they tend to be in uh, their, uh, what he calls pelagic spawners. So they need kind of a, a larger river system or a large lake environment in which to reproduce. Okay. All right. And I have a, <laughs> I have a personal question. Um, I walk my Irish setter across the Des Plaines River at the um, Rockland Road Bridge in Libertyville. Oh, yeah. I've probably uh, I've probably crossed paths with you then. Well, I do about 500 times a year. But <laughs> a number of years ago, someone, I don't know who it was, if that was your organization, put up a river gauge. And it goes from 660 feet at the top, which is actually over the top of the handrail, to uh, 550 feet at the bottom. But and I've also been to a website when I, I can't remember where it is now, but it shows the level, the average level up at 120 in Gurney and down at 22 in, um, in, um, <laughs> in, in Lincolnshire. But is there a way to determine the average rever- level of the river at Rockland Road? H- how does one do that? So the gauge was installed by, I believe, the village of Libertyville. Okay. Um, so the person to contact there would be in their public works department. So I, I don't know if that would be the village engineer or the director of public works who would be able to give you best information. I know the gauge has been surveyed in from my conversations with the village. I'm not sure if the numbers on the gauge are exactly, you know, right down to the same you know, North American vertical datum that the USGS gauge at 120 or at at Route 22 is. So I'm not sure if there's like a little conversion that you have to do, you know, if it says 660 on the gauge, if you have to actually add like a foot and a half or whatever. But yeah, I would contact, um, I'll contact Libertyville Public Works if you're interested in that. And uh, I know they have had that, I know that gauge was surveyed in. And Okay, well, it doesn't go down to the river. I mean, no, I've no, never it's only for it floods. Up. Yeah, it's yeah. for floods. No, I, I understand that. All right. Well, I can give these guys a call, I guess. There's someone over there I should talk to. You said the director of the uh... yeah, director of public works or the village engineer. Okay. Thank you. Super. Thanks, Steve. Um, uh, we have a question from Jacqueline. Does the popularity of aquarium hobbyists contribute to invasive species? Wow, that's a great question and i am going to answer based on what i've heard secondhand from who i would regard as the experts at our lake county health department because they're the ones that respond to um most of the calls that come in about things people find in their detention basins that they don't know if they should be there or not Um, and primarily those are plants and so i would say yes based on my experience um folks releasing aquarium plants uh, that can contribute to invasive species issues in our area. Now, in terms of like, you know, you I mean, I can remember reading, you know, newspaper articles about, you know, somebody catching a piranha in a, you know, warm water outfall from a power plant, you know, that was as big as their head or whatever. Um, you know, with, with our weather, at least historically, our weather patterns, uh, it's probably unlikely that, you know, anything that's not a temperate species is going to survive a winter here, um, or at least two winters here, um, and probably have it have difficulty reproducing. Um, now, in terms of the, you know, temperate species that people might be keeping in, in aquariums, I don't know if those are, are a big problem. Um, you know, goldfish, I guess, tend to occur, you know, with some regularity in, in waters around the county. But to the extent that they're a uh, a management problem, I'm not aware of that. I think it's primarily the plants that come out of those aquariums that, that are a problem. Thank you. And from Ken Lowell, do the round goby prey on zebra mussels and are there zebra <laughs> mussels in the river? That's for my, me. So my understanding is no, I don't believe the gobies prey on the zebra mussels. Um, I, be, 
I don't know if it's quagga, zebra, or both, but I know they have been found. I know there have been colonies found in some of the streams in the watershed. Um, I don't know if any of those are the main stem to Splains River, but I know there are tributaries that where they have found colonies of those. And they're certainly in lakes that are in the Desplaines River watershed. Yeah, thank you. Um, and my question has to do with me going out in my little blue canoe that won the Des Plaines River race before I owned it. I noticed there's an awful lot of sediment in that river. Uh, I put in down at, um, at the park at, in Libertyville. And when I go north, it's, it's just horrible. Is there any, is that natural? Is it just erosion? And is there anything gonna be done about it? So yeah, that's a loaded question, right? So <laughs> yes, erosion is a natural process. That's the easiest answer, right? But is it hastened by, you know, management decisions or activities that uh, we are embarking on as, you know, land users and stewards? Um, so that you know, that's a that's a big variable. Um, when we were developing our watershed plan. Um, you know, our consultant that was assisting us on that was of the opinion that most of the fine sediments that you're probably referring to, most of those are probably the result of bank erosion um, within the stream channel. However, there's also a significant amount of sediment that is probably delivered to the Desplaines River and its tributaries by runoff from uh, basically, you know, bare soil, whether that's, uh, you know, development sites or agricultural land that is not under some sort of uh, cover crop. So those are probably the two biggest sources of sediment to the river. Um, and certainly something can be done about arresting the sources in terms of removing the sediment that's already in the stream. Uh, you know, that's probably more expensive than, you know, it's worth, to, it's probably better to just try to uh, remedy the source of the erosion. And I mean, streams are conveyor belts of sediment all around the world. That's all that, uh, they move a lot of water. And then the thing they move in the next highest volume is sediment. And um, so it's probably a lot cheaper. It'll take a little longer, but a lot cheaper to just let the stream do what it would do naturally and uh, move that sediment out of there over time. Steve, would you take Rosemary's question, please? Sure. Uh, Rosemary says, can you explain what a tile is or was that the farmers used to drain their fields and what is their relation to the Des Plaines? Sure, so a tile is basically a storm sewer for a farm field. Um, it's a, a buried pipe um, that has uh, modern tiles are usually corrugated you know, plastic with little perforations in them. Uh, older tiles were made out, of, made out of clay and had loose joints that would allow water to penetrate into the, into the pipe. And they would basically drain those fields um, much like a storm sewer drains an urban area today. Um, the water would flow into the pipe and through gravity drain down to the lowest point. Usually those tiles would discharge you know, to some sort of ditch or, you know, uh, stream. And so certainly the Des Plaines River and its watershed um, was extensively drained by tiles when it was a primarily agricultural watershed. Um, some of those tile systems have obviously been replaced by urban storm sewer systems today. Um, and some of those tile systems are still in place. Um, thank you. I think we have one final comment from Susan to everyone and to you. Thanks so much, Mike. Uh, appreciate your philosophic, thoughtful approach, <laughs> as we all do. And so I think that's the end of our questions. And I just have a couple of quick comments. Um, we're looking forward, for those of you in the peanut gallery, to um, more information packed programs this year as well as a few adventurous uh, adventures in education. 
Next month on Sunday, April 16th, Bill Eisenmenger will be our, our guest to share the amazing science and mysteries of the Cahokia Mounds in uh, Southwestern Illinois. Bill has written several books about the mines, uh, mounds, excuse me, and is an authority on the archeology span and anthropology of America's first city, a uh, very brief 282 miles Southwest. Um, also, um, for those of you interested, um, and you may wanna join us on this one, Mike, we are planning to visit and tour the Sec Central Lake County Water Agency pumping station on Saturday, May 5th. Um, did you ever wonder where that water coming out of your, your uh, faucets comes from and what happens to it between your house and Lake Michigan? Well, join us um, for a tour on that Saturday afternoon. Um, details, we're going to put the details to sign up on um, our campfire website. And so watch for it on our, our website, we'll be getting that back to you, getting back to you on that. Um, there are a limited number of spaces for that water tour, um, but I've done it and you won't forget it if you go, it's wonderful. Wear your tennis shoes. Um, and we wanna thank Mr. Priscilla again uh, for joining us the, this evening. Um, you'll all be receiving an email from me later and we'll have a copy of this on YouTube, if you want to uh, pause it and look at those maps and those wonderful graphs. Hats off to you and thank you so much for joining us. And um, good night, everyone. You're released. Class is over. Thanks again, everyone. A lot of fun. Wonderful, Mike. Thank you so much.